Okay, I'll start again. Anyway, um, yeah, I am a nanotechnologist and I also believe in Buddhism and yoga. And I always thought, what's nanotechnology got to do with Buddhism? And I could see no relationship. But after maybe 40 years of doing research, I'm starting to really see that they're kind of the same thing. And so this um, picture on the left here, this is uh, UCLA and it's uh, written in individual molecules of carbon monoxide that are really tiny, okay? And it was done by a student of mine who moved these molecules around. And you see some kind of waves at the back, that's um, quantum mechanical uh, phenomena. So this was done in a, a laboratory at minus 270 something degrees centigrade. And it's a very closed system. So it's the ultimate, if you like, in reductionism. And actually, when I got to start to do this type of thing, I got bored. And I thought, is this the end? I mean, we're just sitting goofing around with single molecules for the rest of my life um, in this controlled environment. So in a way, I can't to look at that picture now in a different way. It's not a single molecule. It's a big giant machine connected up to, with wires and cables. There's, you know, tips that are pushing the molecule around. So the whole thing is actually an interconnected system. And what you see there is a kind of illusion. They are single molecules, but they're connected to everything. And then they're connected to my mind also. So I'll talk about, um, this opposite viewpoint I take now to do with science, which is we are not in a closed system, we're in an open system, and open systems are inherently unstable, and the connectivity of these systems introduces emergent behavior. And we're trying to use that, together with nanotechnology, to make a brain, okay? Um, so, This thing is low tech. <laughs> anyway, um, so there's this strange thing in the world that, you know, if we go to the level of uh, metabolism, if we go to how proteins interact with each other, we'll find that certain proteins interact with a whole lot of proteins. Certain proteins, a lot of them just interact with a few proteins. And if, they form a kind of network, and that's shown in the bottom left. If you look at Facebook, there's networks upon networks, and emergent pay behavior constantly occurring in the form of like memes and so on. If you look at the US airline system, we have a network, and not all airports are the same. There are certain airports like Los Angeles and so on are hubs. And if you were to bring down one of the hubs, you bring down the whole network. So this network, upon network, upon network, it starts at the atomic level, and it's actually also a network in our brain, and that's what interests me. So, um, these are two types of network. So the network on the left, these little balls, they're connected roughly to the same number of neighbors, approximately. And when we look at that, we get this kind of bell-shaped curve. This is a kind of statistical distribution of things that you like to think about is kind of normal, it's very abnormal actually. That is not how things look. If you look at you know, people's salaries, uh, the number of people versus their salaries, it doesn't form that kind of connection at all. What's much more likely is the situation on the right, where a few people are connected to many, like an actor. There's also a few people that have, say, sex with many people, and then there's a, um, some people that just have sex with one or zero people. A lot of those, but very few are having sex with everybody, you know? But, but it's not just people, it's, it's everything in nature. So if I can do the next one. Today's computers, everybody thinks they're very powerful, okay? And they really are powerful, and we have to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, I personally don't believe 
there are any real intelligent machines around today. There is weak, kind of weak AI. There's like Robo, Lex, and things like that that are very good at doing limited tasks. But something that can do the type of intelligent task, multitasking we can do, doesn't exist. And at the bottom, you see this giant mass of computers. That's the K computer in Riken in Japan. Now, this computer tried to do a simulation of a person's brain. And it took it 20 minutes to simulate something like 1% of one, one second of a human brain. And it's the most perf one of the most powerful computers in the world. And the reason that has trouble is, is that the complexity of the problem, as it increases, it blows out all proportion. Um, and computers today are not going to get much better. So the iPhone in your pocket has a feature size about 20 nanometers. It can't get much smaller. And recently, this is uh, from my Nature in February, Intel have actually admitted that the end of the so-called Moore's Law, which means that things get better and faster all the time, is coming to an end. So when we try to use conventional computation to um, try to understand any kind of complicated problem in this world, particularly to do with the ecology and so on, it just is becoming increasingly more difficult. This graph is from uh, DARPA. It's a program I worked on. It was called Physical Intelligence. And what you see here is um, at the bottom is complexity. That could be the number of, um, of, of possibilities of things connected to each other, where one thing can influence another, can influence another, and create cascading events. And what you see is that as, this, as the system becomes just a little bit complex, the computer, which I call the von Neumann machine, just a regular like computer you would use, just cannot handle it. It needs to be more and more and more complicated, up to the point of which even a computer that cannot come close to the human mind is would require a nuclear power station just to run that one computer. So uh, are there alternatives? And this is the alternative we've come up with. And it basically throws away all the concepts of how you build a regular type of computer, a digital computer. Uh, and we are making a brain-like computer. So what you can see at the top there is the synaptic, the idea, the synaptic connections in your brain. So these are responsible for learning and some aspects of memory. And the actual gap in the synapse is about you know, some nanometers in size. So what we have done is actually use this atom technology that I showed you earlier to develop an artificial synapse. And what you see of those, that bunch of atoms moving is just a, a kind of comic, an animation of how it works roughly. OK, and this is um, the kind of results we were able to obtain with this uh, device. So this is a single synapse, OK, and it's nanometers in size. And when we put information in infrequently into this, it kind of remembers it and then it forgets it. So it's a short-term memory. But if we repeat it a lot of times, then it will go into what you call a long-term memory state. So here, the number two has been input into this uh, nanosystem. And it, you see the memory fades, the two fades. But when we put the one in very frequently, it remembers. So this is a completely different approach to how normal computers work. And it's a synaptic approach, which is based on biology. Now, the next thing which has to do with the cascading nature of everything is, on the left, what you can see is the stru structure of the neuropil of the neocortex in the brain. And it has this dendritic-like nature. On the right is MRI and some other uh, measurements, functional MRI, of a brain activity. And you see how the activity is distributed through the brain and it moves around. That's from um, Dante Schialvo, who's a good friend of mine. 
This is, represents a kind of what's called sand pile like behavior where sand drops on a pile and then suddenly there's an avalanche. And so in your brain, there's constantly these avalanches going on. So we wanted to create that avalanche behavior from which comes emergent properties. With a neuropil structure, similar to that on the left, but using silver atoms. And so how we do that is to build basically a silver network with synaptic connections. And we have about a billion, over a billion synaptic connections in a tiny little chip about this size. And we want to put it into a state which is not ordered and not chaotic, but in the state of the brain, your brain has a kind of self-organized state, which is a dynamic state, which is between order and chaos. I mean, if your brain was ordered, you'd just be like that, right? And if you were chaotic, you'd be all over the place. So somewhere in between. And so we use self-assembly to do this. And what you see on the middle there is an electron microscope picture of one of our chips that we've made. And what's interesting to note is that if you show that to uh, someone who's a, like a neurobiologist, they would say, oh, it looks like a you know, biological image of neurons. But it's actually not, but it's designed. We use a um, special way to design such things that are chaotic. Opposite of UCLA. And logo UCLA, I wouldn't say UCLA. <laughs> Okay, so this is how we make it. And we have all these little electrodes that are like EEG e, e, um, electrodes that you put on someone's head, but they're very small. And we build on top of this intricate, complex mesh of, uh, of uh, connections and pseudo synaptic junctions. And we start like this. This is what most people would think is good in science, right? Here's a nice ordered structure. But we add some liquid to it, and it starts to grow these nanowires. And if we grow enough of them, we produce what we call is a kind of artificial brain. And this artificial brain, we would like to exhibit this cascading nature that we find in the MRI of, of our brain. We find it also in the activity at earthquakes. We find it in the activity at everything. In fact, some people believe that that nature of our brain, the self-organized critical phenomenon in our brain, was developed because everything around us is also exhibiting that kind of chaotic behavior. And this is one of my students, former students. And you can see the wiring and all the stuff he's going to do. Um, and this is the kind of phenomena we saw. We didn't, people said to us, oh, this thing will just burn out, it'll do nothing. But the first thing we saw was that the energy was distributed all through the network. That's the top picture. And we see these straight lines, which is evidence of, of emergent, emergent phenomena. So this thing becomes live, in a way. I mean, it's a, not the kind of life you might think about, but to me, it was coming alive. And what you see here is on the right, the fMRI behavior of a brain, human brain. And this is the kind of fluct persistent fluctuations we observe in our device. These are imaged electrical activity in the device, like an EEG. And these bursts you see are actually equivalent to like neuronal avalanches. So what we are doing now is using this to build a type of brain computer. And don't look at this in detail, just, it's just too complicated for you guys. But, uh, but the main thing is we have a kind of metabolism for this. A brain has to be given energy all the time, right? Otherwise you'd be dead. And so we put electrical energy in. And the different synapses have to be rewarded somehow. And the reward that they get is more energy. So the synapses that are successful in our experiment get rewarded and they become stronger. 
And it's a comp the idea is that we have no computer program at all. That this thing can learn by itself. And to do that, we do a thing called reservoir computation. But basically, if, if you take a piece of information like a spoken word and you feed it into this device, it will take that signal and it will transform it into much higher dimensions, like 64 higher dimensions, which are the 64 outputs. And those 64 outputs, we can apply a true, not simulated neural type network of a regular computer that's limited, but a true um, neural network system. And we train basically the output layers, but that's a little bit more complicated. Um, and what we're doing, at the moment, we are trying to see if it can predict the future. So we have a series of data that we don't know. We have the past five, you know, we have five, 10 years ago, five years of data. And we are not given the next five years of data. And it's about traffic, traffic activity in Paris, basically. And so from the traffic activity in Paris, we feed it into this device. And we are trying to train it. It's basically called chaotic time series data. We're trying to train it to see if it can predict the traffic data that we don't know for the next five years. That's going to take us a while, but we're doing it. So to finish this talk, you know, I'd like to mention a very uh, good friend of mine, Walter J. Freeman. And Walter J. Freeman um, died just the other week. Uh, he was in Berkeley. And he did a lot of work with rabbits, actually, electrical activity of rabbits' brains. And he came up with a model, a kind of model for, in, for, if you like, intelligence or how the brain works based on six different levels, K-sets, he called it. And so he inspired me greatly. And we spent time together. And he truly believed uh, that such a device can actually uh, be intelligent and think. Now, the thing is about it, and he also believed that about the brain, is that the brain does not end here. The brain or our intelligence extends out forever. If you look at quantum mechanics, you'll find that. <laughs> that was a duck. He was the rabbit. Anyway, fine. Maybe that is extending from the duck to the human. Anyway, he, fa he, he really believed that things extended forever. And you know, things like telepathy, for instance, he had many experiences with telepathy where we can't explain it. Now, coming back to the first slide, which was the atoms and those wavy things. In quantum mechanics, it's also true, to a certain extent, in the theory of quantum mechanics, is that this atom is connected to this atom. Everything is connected. And so somehow that's good for me, because I do believe that you can make an artificial brain, but that brain will have to be connected up to the whole universe, in a way. And secondly, I found a way to think about Buddhism and nanotechnology as a just the one thing. And I managed to get rid of reductionism in my life as much as possible. Anyway, thank you very much.